When it's moving day at midnight and the borders bolt their doors, when the watchmen blink and the gunmen wink and the Darlinghurst landlord snores, oh, it's then that we climb through windows to take the moon for a ride and fumble and drag at a Gladstone bag with a couple of shirts inside. For we go like ancient Arabs whenever the mood invites. We haven't a tent, but we don't pay rent. Hooray for Arabian nights. There's a ghost on the second story. There's a phantom hand below, but little of ghosts who slide down posts does the soul of the landlord know. Oh, little he thinks of moonlight, and little he thinks of rent. He just mutters and moans as he dreams of loans at a hundred and five percent. For we go like ancient Arabs whenever the mood invites. We haven't a tent, but we don't pay rent. Hooray for Arabian nights. <laughs> These were my childhood tags. Nothing much has changed. And there, there was this recent description of me in the Daily Press, which read, Les Robinson, that peculiar humorist, a demented hobgoblin, maddeningly and madly shaking hands with everyone. Hmm. Well, I had good reason to circulate, since The Giraffe's Uncle is my first book after many years of magazine contributions. I wish to thank I wish to thank Ken Slesser for that kind introduction and his tremendous futuristic prediction that the book will find more readers in 1993 than 1933. Marvelous that. <laughs> there are nights when I cannot be found. Complaints have been frequent. People wonder where I am. It makes me laugh. Have you ever heard of a haunted ravine where in the middle of the night a dinner bell rings? That is where to look for me. But listen carefully. The ravine is full of echoes. You seem to hear hundreds of dinner bells. Upon my word, they appear to be everywhere. Your hair stands on end. You run for your life. 
You can't hear me laughing. The dinner bells are after you. <laughs> if I'm trying anything at all with my stories, it is to push literature into the more exciting waters of cosmopolitanism and to build absurd, dreamlike worlds out of my experiences of the everyday. At least to get away from stockmen, drovers, and kangaroos. <laughs> I don't think I'm merely a humorist. I, I, I can't always sustain it for long stories, but at times I have serious modernist intentions. Song of the Flea is a good example. Uh, not in the least surprised to find that I was a man no longer but had become a flea, I was nevertheless somewhat astonished that my recumbent human presentiment could go on breathing calmly while I, the, the uh, entity so lately inhabiting it, but now encased in gleaming black flea armor, looked on, luxuriating in its warmth. I had never noticed before that humans were irresistibly appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that appeared, Jack Lindsay wrote that I was a lesser Kafkaist fantasist. <laughs> that had something to do with animals and alienation, possibly. Robertson! Robertson! What the blazes are you doing in there? You should have finished that two hours ago! You useless lover! With the faraway eyes! I do not like brain darling work. I never did. It interferes with the digestion. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why it's quite unusual for me to do any. <laughs> oh, working on my writing is a different matter. I know I should be grateful for paid work, but already I feel like a replenishing drink with a rat bag companion or two up at Bill Snudden's star on George Street, or a coffee at Mockbell's in Pitt Street next to the Theatre Royal. Uh, I'm sweeping to pay outstanding bills. The only thing I dislike more than paying bills is paying rent. That is why I reside in caves around Middle Harbour or in tumble-down houses without any roofs on the outskirts of the city. I like to pitch my tent in a small room if possible. If there's a heavy rainstorm, I'm better protected. A Peruvian palm-reading friend of mine told me that by the 21st century, Sydney people will work an average of 50 to 60 hours a week, more than any industrialized nation. Why, they would want to put themselves through such back-breaking toil. And in a landscape where Anthony Trollope wrote, Sydney Harbour is so inexpressibly lovely that it makes a man wonder whether it is worth his while to move his household goods to the eastern coast of Australia in order that he might look at it for as long as he can look at anything. That's all quite beyond me. But then again, so are many other things. <laughs> and I haven't the faintest idea what to do about them in my unfortunate nature. evening. When I'm in my cave, trying to get to sleep, thankful there won't be any roosters around to wake me early, I remember all my walks to the artist cafes of the early 20s. Those flighty girls, roses in their hair, their scarves and maple dresses conjuring linguistic delights. Well, I'd get tipsy in those days. I'd watch a beauty from afar. Uh, and think, oh, wouldn't she exhaust the fellow nicely? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss the Café La Bovee, a meeting place for all the madmen of town, as Ray Lindsay used to say. 
Good evenings in my favorite pubs with those colossal barmaids imbibing me with sweet red. <laughs> Luscious Betsy Matthews feeding me. <laughs> All the women so kind to me. I would have laid them on a wondrous pageantry of the nut if only I could have afforded it. <laughs> Alas, a bohemian cuts himself off from being able to seduce the princesses of the eastern suburbs unless they are forever committed to a full rebellious mode. How different things may have been if I could have honoured my parents' wishes and become a concert pianist or a something tenor or a violin shooter instead of a cave-dwelling fantasist. <laughs> <laughs> it was Pascal who wrote, and greatest problem is that he cannot stay in his room. It was Les Robinson who wrote, Les Robinson's greatest problem is that he cannot stay in his cave. <laughs> I live between desires for solitude, for tranquility, for camping, fishing, for writing, reading, and gramophone listening. And then I want to feel the city under my toes and cause a little havoc in Bohemia! People wonder how I survive! It is indeed a precarious livelihood I lead as a hat and intermittent freelancer for the Bulletin, of Punch, and Vision. That's the Lindsay magazine. Oh, there is another irregular source of income, the Australian worker. <laughs> Early on time for them. <laughs> it allows for beer, red wine, bowl spaghetti, but it's not enough for grander things. I have no wife, no children. I survive. Happily, the freelance life involves little physical rigor, a devotion to a warm, outdoorsy indolence, and time for the two things I love above all else writing and lying on my back listening to classical music. <laughs> my gramophone is always <coughs> handy. Often I place it on my favorite rocks where an afternoon nap is in communion with the day. But not that I had this luxury as a young man. I performed terrible jobs. A poultry farm was the worst. Winter, plunging about in the mud with numbed fingers, watering and feeding fowl, cleaning out fowl houses, mending wire netting, digging drains, and just working for my keep. No wages. My employer was a skinflint. It lasted a year and led me nowhere. I fear life in the country. <coughs> I mean, rather, life inland. My love of coastal nature around Sydney is a different matter. Suffering from loneliness, I returned to Sydney. I became a salesman, a collector, a canvasser of advertisements, a clerk in government offices. I did three years hard labor in the head office of a wealthy company. I ended under medical treatment. <laughs> Through it all, I, I met many different types of men. I began collecting stories and yarns. All those commonplace situations fed the imagination. Reality was the trigger, but reality is not what I'm interested in. I want the imagination to work hard, to push the limits, to consume the story once I've found my setting. That I am able to write at all is due to my friend, Harry, Henry Green, HM, he lent me books, Gave me tips on literary construction and style. Alongside Harry's advice, I read Oh, Flaubert, Chekhov, Maupisson, <laughs> Strindberg, Gorky. Dad would often read to me for a couple of hours each evening. Robinson Crusoe, Swiss Family Robinson, The Boys Own Daniel. <laughs> Some nights we'd laugh together so much, we'd get the hiccups. He gave me a great gift a natural sense of humor. I beg your pardon. Why, why do you say such cruel things about my stories? They mean no harm. I mean no harm to anyone. I've already read one damning review today. Please, leave me be. 
It's not my fault if you perceive my stories to be overwritten or childish or lacking courage or basking in a sense of the florid. Please leave me to my own devices. You hurt me with your brutal and callous appraisals. You, you, you leave me, you, you, you leave me alone. Go and laugh at me somewhere else with your taunts, your pompous and self-righteous 19th century naturalistic sensibilities. I need no more punches to my brittle soul. No more. What do you see? Do you see how you've hurt me? <coughs> to flatten me. Oh, what can I do? If only I knew. Bohemia may release those ready to ride the waves of fame and notoriety, but not I, I wouldn't imagine. I am a small but select body of admirers, but it is preposterous to perceive my reputation growing much further, not in this young country. All around me, families sleep. The depression has brought them. The authorities turn a blind eye now. No one can afford accommodation. Only Germany has a higher unemployment rate. The caves are no place for women with little ones. But the women have arrived because of alcoholic husbands still traumatized by the war. They Every night, sleep under newspapers in the domain. They were men who took the boat with youthful relish, with grand hopes. When a policeman kicks one of them, he's kicking a man whose dream was stolen. When he kicks me, he's venting his annoyance at my uncompromising ways. Robinson, get a job. Robinson, <laughs> pay some rent. Robinson, get off your back. You get boils, you lie down so much. Sometimes, after a refreshing lie down, I like to partake of a good natured wrestle in the botanic gardens with a not too deep policeman. Go <laughs> about a blubber or a seafarer, out on a Sunday stroll, one feels alive after that. Oh, I am getting a bit past it. <laughs> Forty-seven years old. <coughs> Maybe though I should look for a partner tomorrow in town. <coughs>
forget that opening. That wild man on the horse to Groot, cutting the ribbon, believing that only a member of the royal family should open it. The Groot, no doubt, would admire the woman's weakling as well. I find myself retreating more and more from society as I get slower and older. A hermit might be my future, although at the more social end of the scale. Sometimes I can spend hours wondering about the meaning of the word useful. All my life I've been judged as lacking in usefulness. People never believe me, but once or twice I have lost positions at work, not through doing too little work, but by doing too much. My impossible contradictions, baffling, stifling. I need to get these shoes off and go fishing for my supper around Middle Harbour. I also need to pick up something else to read besides the Australian Woman's Weekly. <laughs> Tolstoy or Chekhov ever allowed themselves an indulged peek at its most attractive pages? I do think Flaubert would have admired. Women pass by me now, and I can only pant besides their loveliness. Oh, I'm sorry. That was inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shall take my leave. Uh, off to my cave I go. <laughs> On the day that I was born, it was a cold and frosty morn in the famous suburb known as Woolloomooloo. It was down in Riley Street where me folks first heard me bleat, cause at the time I'd nothing else to do. Oh, me mother died of fright when she saw me in the night. Me father said he'd send me to the zoo. But I owe a lot to him, cause he taught me how to swim the day he heaved me off the pier at Woolloomooloo. <laughs> Oh, me name it is McCarty, and I'm a rorty party. I'm rough and tough as an old man kangaroo. Some people think I'm crazy. I don't work because I'm lazy. I just tag along with the boozing throng in the push from Woolloomooloo. Now, when I was just a lad, I went straightway to the bad. A larrikin so hard you'd strike me blue. But the government was kind, and they didn't seem to mind, and in Darlinghurst I spent a night or two. Now the judge gave me a stare, and he said, you're a lair. They heaved me into Darlinghurst jail, you understand. They gave me clothes, they cut me hair, I didn't seem to care, and every night you'd find me in the van. Oh, me name it is McCarty, and I'm a rorty party. I'm rough and tough as an old man kangaroo. Some people think I'm crazy. I don't work because I'm lazy. I just tag along with the boozing throng in the bush from Woolloomooloo. So I spent some years in jail till I began to quail and resolved to live upon a different lay and enlisted in the ranks of the Salvation Army cranks. You can bet I made that bloody business pay. <laughs> so hallelujah, I'm a lout. I knows me way about. I kids the mugs that I'm converted to. All the lassies there I mash, and I'm never short of cash, as I beats me drum all over Woolloomooloo. <laughs> Oh, me name it is McCarty, and I'm a rorty party. I'm rough and tough as an old man kangaroo. Some people think I'm crazy. I don't work because I'm lazy. I just tag along with the boozing throng in the bush from Woolloomooloo. <laughs>
family go in. I can't sleep for fear it'll bring the shack down. Cutting through the planks, getting into my lungs, making me nervous and highly strung. The shack hasn't collapsed yet, but it's so wonky in weather like this. I can only stay up all night with my clothes on, expecting the worst. I almost wish I was back in Manly Hospital being treated for bronchitis. I was warm there. Mary, bless him, invites me over sometimes, but I can't bring myself to go anywhere. Harry's always trying to buck me up. In his last letter, he told me of a deaf man who was taken up in an aeroplane 40,000 feet and completely regained his hearing. I think he hoped this might rejuvenate my comic spirits. But I don't seem to have any ideas for yarns. One needs to move around a bit in order to acquire the material. I'm anchored in one spot all the time, going for days on end without exchanging a word to a, a living soul. deters me most about going anywhere is to return from attractive surroundings to nothingness and squalor. It's a stifling conundrum, baffling. If I knew what to be doing about it, I'd be doing it. But I haven't a clue. Some people have even asked if I had Aboriginal blood in my veins. <laughs> and I've lost my companion as of last week. Alfred George. Named after A.G. Stevens, the Bulletin's first literary editor. <laughs> I think I needed him more than he needed me. <laughs> he was someone who I could confide in. He was always trying to give me advice. <laughs> Exclaiming in his sandpaperish voice, Look ahead! Look ahead! Oh, thanks for reminding me, I'd say whenever I'd hear it. But how? I then asked myself, can I heed your warnings and avert disasters major or minor which may be impending? Memoirs of a professional escaper, a story of mine, not some years ago, has just appeared in German translation in a Viennese anthology of Australian stories. <laughs> We had so often got the sack, either separately or both together, that we were inured to a life of leisure and led it at all times and as often as possible. We had answered innumerable advertisements in the slaves wanted column of the newspaper and had been ignored. Pretending to be energetic fatigued us. <laughs> When this good news came from Europe, I thought back to A.G. Stevens. Robinson, he said, I'm not a man given to florid excesses in literature or comic stupidity, but you are oddly likable and not without a mild form of modest talent. <laughs> <laughs> People think I'm antisocial. But this isn't true. Congenial companionship has at times meant more to me than anything. Rather than antisocial, I suppose, I have become anti-society. I've spent the last few Christmas days under a tree with a book. It's the same as any Sunday to me. Even being a writer is less on my mind these days. Oh, managing the shack has taken over getting the washing dry, clearing the bark and weeds from my immediate surrounds, making sure the, the birds and all the snakes and lizards keep their distance, dealing with the unwanted involvement of bees, <laughs> just making sure I stay warm enough to ward off another bout of illness. I'm trying to take cod liver oil regularly. There's a little small wood shop close by which sells sheep's tongues in aspic 
for four and a half each. The same price since 43. <laughs> then a little salad and a tincture of mustard. They are just what one craves. The ideal breakfast of a hot morning. <laughs> Afterwards, I eat plenty of pawpaw. I, I always keep a pawpaw handy. My mother's recommendation. Blessed old soul. I was an indulged child. <laughs> My fellow learned men, the man we have been searching for lives in Sydney, Australia, <laughs> in a cave. They do not understand Liz Robinson in that far away land. Contemporaries are passing on. These last years I've seen little of them anyway. I, I find myself dependent for human contact on chance meetings with acquaintances. And my chest makes it sometimes too much to face another day of chores around the shack. What's more, people are trying to move me on. I even went and looked at another shack I saw advertised but the owner wasn't willing to let it for residential purposes. <laughs> so dry and solid to me. It's baffling, all of it. What can I do? Then I saw one in the newspaper, which looked very inexpensive, but I would have had to move to Norfolk Island. <laughs> what an impractical solution. Dad, I remember... Seventy-three years old. Never thought I'd get this far. Gets less than stay reasonable health. To everyone but a few such as Ken, I'm nothing more than an alienated curiosity in the world of Australian letters. I suppose the odd bulletin reader must have noticed my name every now and then. Don't become a writer, my boy. They often become alcoholics. They make little or no money, look at Lawson, famous but in poverty, always down on his luck. You should have persisted with music, done your lessons properly. We gave you every opportunity. But the traditional mechanics of life were just too much for me. Bohemia was the one place I could find kinship. Oh, how I baffled that interviewer from Home Magazine in the 20s when asked of my favorite Yuletide beverage at Christmas. How she blushed when I replied, condensed steam from innumerable Christmas puddings, slightly teachered with brilliantine. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived a good portion of my life at a snail's pace. A pace unacceptable to the majority. I've been a strange insect author, keeping a watchful eye on a prawn or a John Dory. Menial jobs, clerical jobs. I just couldn't face the endless days of a hard employer ordering me around. The nightmare cycle of days and years swelling over me like a Bondi dumper. I had to live outside of it. I had to! Although my sense of hard won freedom has brought its own monotony, a sense of futility and, and worthlessness. Oh, what say, Les, my boy? We leave your mother for a few hours of peace and head over the cliff tops to Clavelli for a spot of fishing and swimming. <laughs> we could both do with a cheer up, couldn't we? Oh, Dad. Dad. 
Had I been a better writer or a more widely read one, I would have had more peace of mind, but I doubt much would have changed. I've written a reasonable amount, I suppose. But more than was ever published, or will be. I write on anything at times, scraps of newspaper, corners of already typed sheets. I remember my walks into town with a plan to look for work. I get sidetracked and start writing while sitting on park benches. And by the time I made it all the way in, after my little writing stops, it was too late in the day to look. <laughs> I'd go to the cinema instead if I had a few spare pennies. Sometimes my anonymity felt like a grand prize. Summers over Middle Harbour, where I was happy to be alone in the natural world, fishing for crustaceans, watching the ants and lizards navigate the rocks, listening to the birds harmonize in the trees. All those birds all seem to know me well. If I made one enormous mistake, it was selling the shack, which Dad owned when he passed on in 1941. Don't sell that shack, Liz! Liz, you'll need it! You'll need it later in life with your funny ways. You listen to your old mother, Liz, and you listen well. Now, when are you coming over for afternoon tea? You could do with some meat on your bones. I'm just taking an orange Jaffa cake out of the oven. I worry about you, Les. I worry about you even in my grave. Oh, Mum. Mum. Why I sold it to pay rent on another. I never know. Damn unpaid bills, I suppose. What a hostile period my life has been. The Boer War, well, World War One and Two, the Korea War. Not many Australians will live to see their fellow countrymen go down in four different wars. I will never forget Ken Slesser giving me a copy of Beach Burial when he came back at Snowden's Hotel, when he came back from being the official correspondent. <clears throat> at night, they sway and wander in the waters far under, but morning rolls them in the foam. Between the sob and clubbing of the gunfire, Someone, it seems, has time for this, to pluck them from the shallows and bury them in burrows and tread the sand upon their nakedness. <coughs> I could never write like Ken. Who could? I'd love to see Ken again. I'd love to see him. How he supported the giraffes, uncle. How he used to go for after a schooner or two. <laughs> Among other new arrivals at a certain zoo was a remarkably thin giraffe. It appeared to be suffering from granulation of the eyelids, a perpetual inclination to giggle, and a desire to be thought clever. <laughs> it was a present to the zoo from middle up infanticides, disinfectant, and inextricably mingled circus and menagerie, permanent address, Sudan Avenue, off Little Sahara Street, Mubu Zembombubu. <laughs> Ken always supported me in trying to get a second book published. So did young Doug Stewart. It just seemed to get harder as time went by. It seemed you needed to have a brother or a cousin or an aunt who knew someone well in the major publishing houses just so you could get an appointment. Publishers knew, despite my affiliations and magazine contributions, that I wouldn't sell much. 
Oh, Frank Johnson. Oh, oh, oh. He knew it best of all. He's still holding on his shelves every remaindered copy of the giraffe's uncle. Bless him. No wonder he was reluctant to publish me again after the Second World War, or, even though he liked my work very much. It would have pleased me to publish more books, but in the long run, like so many things, there was nothing I could do in the end. For six years, I had troubles with my heart. Oh, it began when I organized the patient. That was lucky since it provided me with free medical attention and treatment. I would write to Harry that I felt as though my life had deteriorated in all areas, that no one could be interested in my dwindling world. He must have tired of opening my letters. Everything seemed to come to a standstill. The old creative faculty went on strike as well. The bulletin had a change of guard. I kept trying to contribute, but I couldn't get anything in. Expensive homes started going up around the shack. Endless workmen, pneumatic drills, the Progress Association stamping over a retrogressionist like myself. Everyone in Sydney, it seemed, began stomping around my shack. <coughs> I wonder if there's anything in the post office box in Sydney, in Seaforth. For weeks I haven't had the strength to get up there. Perhaps there's a letter from Ken. I will never forget him for writing that my work will be better understood in 1993 than in 1933. I'll always be heartened by that prediction. If I just had enough strength to get up to the post office box, I could probably continue on and surprise a few at the Australia Hotel in town. I could sneak into the long bar via the Bohemian haunts of Rose Street. I always loved the dark side entrance of that hotel. I could chew the ears off all those two shilling knobs, regale them with a few tall stories. They haven't seen me in a while. They must think I'm dead. <laughs> I brought this speculation on myself, no doubt. I should force myself to go. I'd look around for Ken, first of all. I wonder if he drinks anywhere special these days. And all those elephant-drinking cartoonists must be around somewhere as well. And Doug Stewart, he's not old. Oh, how disheartening it is to recall my dedication in the front of the giraffe's uncle to all my friends. Uh, my fault again, I suppose. But what could I do? What could I do? Any decision, big or small, seems to become more and more difficult as time goes by. Uh, what? Dad? Dad? How, how did you know I was here? I, I must tell you, Dad, I, I let you down. I sold the shack. It was the greatest mistake of my life. What am I saying? Oh, that can't be Dad. It must be Harry. Harry. I can give him the German translation of memoirs of a professional escaper. He reads German. I meant to post it. Harry, Harry, come in. You don't need to knock, old friend. After all those letters, all those letters you so kindly answered, and now you've come to visit. I've got a couple of extra sheep's tongues we can have for dinner. Come in, Harry, come in. Mr. Robinson. It's Patrick Smith from the State Department of Housing. We want you to come with us to look at a housing commission room in Addington. I think you'd be better off if you go there. Mr. Robertson, we've been sending you letters in regards to this. Would you kindly open the door? That's crazy, my colleagues. It's not understood in that wild hill land. We at the Academy should provide him with a boat ticket and a room at Vienna University. In translation, my fellow academics, Mr. Robinson is a bold original seeker, a modernist of the highest order, 
and, and a guest, guest communicator, communicator of, the of the fantastic nature of the human condition! Mr. Robinson! Mr. Robinson! Would you please open the door? The department now has a room available for you in Paddington. You said you'd be willing to go there on the form that you filled out. A new yarn. How the old creative faculty strikes at the oddest times. The story of a hippopotamus trying to hit all the journalists, eat all the journalists of Sydney for giving the city citizens crude misinformation about the state of their roofs. Oh, Ken will love it. Oh, I can't wait to tell Harry the good news. That people will love shoes and suit pants best of all. <laughs> He'll eat the bankers first! <laughs> oh, how ravenous he'll be! <laughs>